Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, episode 216. I am your host, Michael. Joining me this week, both from Truth and Facts About Sports, Daniel from the Inscriber. What's going on, fellas? Hey, glad to be here. How's it going? Indeed, indeed. As I say, to begin every episode, Pound for Pound Boxing Report, live YouTube show, as well as podcast and blog discussing all things boxing. Amount of ways when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is, if it concerns the sweet science, it will get talked about. If you want to find out, find out all information regarding Pound for Pound Boxing Report, blog page is the place to go to, p4pboxingreport.wordpress.com. That's the link. You check the right of the blog page. You'll find links to the channels and pages on Facebook, G+, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, as well as links to where you can find the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher Radio, Player FM for the folks in the UK, as well as um, Mixed Cloud. Let's get the show started this evening, uh, recapping what went down this past weekend. Um, we've been consistent here talking about the uh, World Boxing Super Series uh, Cruiserweight Tournament and how, uh, how terrific of a tournament it has been. Uh, basically good bouts all throughout. Well, on Saturday uh, uh, in Moscow, I believe it was, um, the finals of the Cruiserweight Tournament is Alexander Yusek fought Murat Gassiev, undisputed unified Cruiserweight champion. Uh, we, re we, pr we previewed the, sh the fight uh, last week. I admit that I felt that Usek may be the better fighter, but I was unsure of whether he will get the decision. Well, um, my worries about Usek getting a, a just decision was just emphatically wrong. He dominated. Um, I don't know if I could give uh, Garcia more than a round, and I'm, I may be generous in giving him a round. Uh, Usek boxed the shoes off, clear-cut decision uh, to become unified, undisputed cruiserweight champion, winner of the World Boxing Series Cruiserweight Tournament. I'll go to you first, Bo. Uh, you have to give it up to Usek. Uh, one of the performances of the year, arguably the performance, the best performance so far in 2018. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think for you're going to have a lot of people that's probably going to be disappointed because this was built, the type of fight it was built to be was different than what it turned out to be. If you watch the tournament that we always had a knockout, we always had somewhat of a bomb burner. And this fight was just totally opposite of that. But, you know, how strange is it that uh the so-called boring style or not so entertaining style that Abel Sanchez complains about is the one that actually beat his fighter's ass um when you look at what Usyk did uh he showed his his he he he, he showed us something that we hadn't seen in the Bradis fight and even in a um the the uh previous fight before that and I even go back to Michael Hunter it seemed like the Usyk that we remember who was who that we saw over this past Saturday was going. He was staying in the pocket a little bit more. Um, Bradis was able to control him with the jab a little bit. But then you look at this fight, and it just goes to show this why I like this series was he raised his game to another level. This was the biggest fight of, of his career. Everything was on the line, and he came in there, and from the word go, he never allowed Gassiev to get into a groove. He never allowed him to get comfortable build even the slightest amount of confidence. Um, Gassiev did touch him with the right hand, but the problem was Usyk's movement <clears throat> was so consistent that Gassiev never got a chance to sit down on the punch and throw something hard because every time he would try to touch him, he wasn't there or he was in a different spot. So, I mean, all around great performance. I mean, um, um, like you said, try, I tried to give Gassiev two rounds, at least at the very least two rounds, but even Gassiev knew it. Um, it was it, it it was a performance that when I think we're gonna sit back and we're gonna look at this, and in my opinion, he definitely separated himself. He separated himself from everybody else and moved up into the level status. The question is, will he be able to go up to heavyweight, put on two hundred and ten, maybe two hundred and fifteen pounds, and st still try to maintain that that amount of mobility? But I mean, a great performance, man. Uh, just I mean, you really can't say much to it. I, I felt. It's it's sad because you know how good Gassiev is. Gassiev is a good fighter, and that's the thing about it. Was Gassiev is a good fighter. If you watch his performance in the tournament, you didn't think this is what this is what was going to happen. So, that hey, great performance, man. 
Oh, I see Jacob is joining us. Thanks for joining us on the show, Jacob. I'll go to you, uh, Daniel, and then you can follow up, Jacob. Uh, yeah, uh, to, I can't really add much more to uh, much more than what Bo said. Um, outstanding performance by Usyk. Uh, for me, Gassiev, to Bo's point, when he hit him clean, I think it was in round four, and Usyk took it and still continued to box and stay disciplined throughout that round. Um, to me, the fight was over at that point because you can tell, as both said from jump, that the superior su superiority from Usek, uh, it showed itself early, early in the fight. Uh, he neutralized Gassiev completely to the point that uh, last three, four rounds at about, Gassiev had like a dumbfounded look on his face like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to adjust to this. He's just too good. Let I'll I'll full disclosure right now. I am re-watching the fight right now for the fourth time. Because that's how good and how dominating that performance from Usyk was. Mm -hmm. Like in my show, I predicted Usyk because I under I think he knew what he was up against. He was in literal enemy territory. And he was against a guy that had a pretty good punching power, and that was always one of the questions that you had with Usyk. Did he have the chin to sustain an attack of somebody that had the work rate of Gassiev? And not only is the answer yes, but it's not so much that he took, took the punch, took it on the chin. He completely deflated Gassiev. By the eighth round, you can already tell Gassiev didn't know what to do. Like he hit him with his best right hand. He hit him to the body. He tried to put him on the ropes. But Usyk was just able to jab, maneuver, land better combinations, land uppercuts, clean uppercuts inside and outside. And it was just a performance where I, that was my main concern with Gassiev. Gassiev showed great patience and great stamina against Dorticos. But that was against the Dorticos that only had pretty much a one-two punch as his offense or his counter offense. Usyk had body attacks. He had lateral movement. He had uppercuts. He had straight rights. He had straight lefts. He had the complete package. And I think... The combination of that, we have to remember, folks, if you look at the punch stats, shh, Usyk wound up tripling Gassiev, tripling, in punch, total punches. Usyk landed more jabs than Gassiev threw. I forgot the number, but it's an obscene difference. And... When you have that level of opposition, that level of pedigree up against somebody, I, I don't blame Gassiev for being really, really confused. He was just thoroughly, thoroughly a box. And it, it was to the point where you never had to worry about any controversy on the cards. That it would have been obscenely criminal. If even one of those judges tried to give the fight to Gassiev. I think only two judges gave him one round. And the other judge was straight sweep. That's how good this fight is. And that's how good Usyk is overall. At understanding the situation. Understanding the significance of it. And knowing what he must do. And that was a worry that I had from him, actually, since he left Mr. Bashir. Because Russ Abder really doesn't really strike me as that good of a trainer. But we also have to remember that Usyk still has, in this corner, or at least in this circle, Papa Lomachenko. So he can always try to guide Usyk back to base with it. Now... Obviously, the future, there's talk of Tony Bellew. 
And like there's just talk of there's nothing to do with Cruiserweight. You united it. You're the first person to do so since Holyfield. And that's true to an effect, but the main worry is Usyk was able to outpoint and able to outstrike and outdistance Gassiev. But he never got in a situation where Gassiev was just flat out hurt. It was more of a situation where there was just so many punches coming from many different directions that Gassiev just didn't know what how to count. And I don't think you can I don't think you can pretty much count on that in the heavyweight, at least among like the top three or four. I don't think you can do that with with a Joshua a bit if you don't have punching power. You can tr you can outbox Deontay Wilder, but Lord knows, don't let him catch you with the right hand. And like I said, it, oh, okay, I thought you was finished. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I guess the same for I guess the same for Luis Ortiz with his left hand, and even goes the same to the likes of Dillian White and Big Baby Miller. So it's a good. A really, really dominating performance. Just for the love of God, somebody just find a picture of Vucic where he doesn't look like a serial killer. <laughs> I go to you. I go to you, Jacob. Um, what Andre Ward did during the uh, Super Series, the Super Six, excuse me, back in '09 through I think it was 2012, uh, 2011, I should say, 2012. Um, that's what Usyk did here. Uh, when Ward won that tournament, you couldn't deny that he was pound for pound um, within the pound for pound rankings after that. I, I would put Usyk um, in a similar position. Um, he's pound for pound, no doubt, after this accomplishment and high on the pound for pound list. Your thoughts, Jacob? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, he definitely deserves a spot on that list uh, in the top, you know, five, if not top three. Um, for the accomplishment, and you know, first off, he he did it. Uh, you know, he executed his game plan. He stayed focused, and he put on a, a you know a marquee performance. So my, you know, my hats off to him. Um, you know, with the whole Gassiev thing, you know, I was expecting a little bit more. And in between rounds, uh, in the corner, you you can hear um, Abel Sanchez uh, yelling at him. I think it was like round seven or eight, like you, you got to try, you got to do something, you know? Um, I didn't hear all the instructions that they were giving him, but this, this tells me a lot about, um, you know, it, sometimes it's not the trainer. Sometimes it's the fighter. Like if they don't have a plan B when they go into, to these fights and, you know, and they, they're lost, like Gossi have seemed, you know, this, that spells trouble, you know, cause I, I didn't give Gossi have not, one round. I didn't give him any rounds. So it was a complete blowout. Um, you know, I would have liked to see him, you know, take some risk, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're like in the sixth or seventh round and you know, you're not, you're, you know, your game plan's not working, you know, what Usyk was throwing was a lot of pitter patter shots, you know, they were just kind of like blinding him. So he, you know, he can, you know, land his lefts and rights and he just, he was just throwing a lot of volume, but I don't think that they were really hurting. They weren't hurting shots or, or, uh, telling shot. So, um, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, you know, risk getting hit a little bit to, you know, get inside and, and be able to, to land your punches. Um, he did some good body work at the very beginning of the fight. And, you know, um, I think that that was, you know, that's a good strategy, but you can't just, you, you can't win a fight if you're just going to sit there in the pocket and, and, you know, wait for him to tee off on you. Um, you know, with eight unanswered shots, you know, you're just not going to win that fight. And then a little too late, you know, he's throwing, you know, like haymakers and just, you know, trying to get them with desperation shots. So, um, you know, it, I just thought it was a poor, poor executed game plan. Um, I'm not sure if it was uh, Gassiev himself. Uh, he, he does seem to have maybe some mental weaknesses when it comes to, you know, um, I think I've heard with his camp that he, you know, he, his, his biggest uh, weakness is that his belief in himself you know, even when he entered the tournament, like, you know, um, as he was winning and, and getting further and further, like he started to get more confidence. But 
Um, Usyk, on the other hand, is very confident, and you know he 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 moves very well. Um, I'd like to see him do a little bit more body work. I didn't see hardly any body work from Usyk in that whole fight. Um, he was doing a lot of like just the head shots and and whatnot. Um, but you know it was it was a good uh, series, and you know I'm excited about the the upcoming series. And you know hats off to Usyk. Um, both Bo and Daniel alluded to the future of um, Usyk, who called out Tony Bellew after the fight. Bellew responded in kind, saying, basically, I'm here, I'm ready. And Usyk res responded even further and basically said, let's do it. The question is, I'll just open up for anybody who wants to respond. Do you think we will see that fight um, either later this year or 2019. Um, the thing I will note, though, is that when Bellew had the title um, at Cruiserweight and Usek was there for him to fight, Bellew was like, nah, um, I'll go other route. Um, now that Usek has won this tournament, he's all of a sudden saying, let's make this fight happen. To me, it seems like he smells money. Your thoughts? <laughs> Well, that's exactly what it is, Mike. He smells money. <laughs> you hit it. You you hit it right on the head with that. Well, not only does it that it, it that he smell he smells money. Um, Bell, you he needs another he he needs another challenger. D just listen, David Hay is not there. He's going. Um, Joseph Parker is busy. I doubt very seriously he's going to try to fight either. De well, we already know what how he feels about Deontay Wilder. He's, I remember he made the comment once he was up on Deontay Wilder, he realized that he just didn't want that smoke and uh, Anthony Joshua. So the next logical, you know, and Andre Ward retired. So the next logical thing for him would be an Usyk. So um, I could see it happening. Like you said, it's definitely he smells money. And I, and I even think that's why Usyk is even entertaining because he smells money also as well. And, I said this on my show earlier. He needs to strike while the iron is hot. That's why when we was talking about possible guys he could fight, <laughs> it's like, yeah, you got to strike while the iron is hot. I, I do want to make one correction. And every, everybody says this, and because Daniel said it earlier, everybody thinks Evander Holyfield is the last cruiserweight to be undisputed. It's actually a guy by the name of O'Neal Bell. The problem was, I think, as soon as he became undisputed, like a month later, he got stripped by the IBF. So people really pretty much forgets about him. And then about four months later, that same year, that's when the WBO became uh, recognized by the governing bodies. But people forget about O'Neill Bell. He was the last cruiserweight, three belt undisputed champion in cruiserweight division. Um, but you know what else, though? I, I'm curious. I actually would like to see Usyk stay and defend because you, I think you rarely get an undisputed guy that defends that undisputedness. We haven't had one do it. Um, uh, Holyfield didn't do it when he did it. He went right to heavyweight. And I get it. You got to strike while the iron is hot. I kind of would like to see him make a defense. But then again, if the performance that we saw, because the only person he would fight is Bradis. So if the performance that we saw in the um, in the uh, Garcia fight, I, I can't, man, you know, if he does that against Bradis, Bradis don't stand a chance. And, you know, give credit to Usyk. I think you have to, I think the reason why, as Daniel alluded, why he felt comfortable is he, he remember he fight Glowacki, he fought uh, most of his fights has always been on the road in somebody else's backyard. So I think that's why he felt a lot comfortable going into um, um, Garcia's backyard and fighting that way and not worrying about whether he was going to get the decision or not. Your thoughts, uh, Jacob and Daniel, on the uh, f future of Alexander Usek? Um, I, I think the Bellew thing is, is, I don't know, I don't consider Bellew a top you know, heavyweight or even a, a challenge. Um, I think that's just kind of like a cherry picking move in my, my opinion. Um, I agree with Bo. I'd like to see, I mean, there, there's other fighters that were in the tournament that I'd like to see Usyk fight, um, you know, cause uh, uh, just, you know, just to, just to see what would happen, you know, at different styles, you know, uh, you know, Dorticas or um, even, um, you know, there's the rematch with the uh, Brutus or, um, you know, there, there's just different fighters I, I'd like to see him fight. And le, unless he's going to move up to heavyweight, um, I prefer him to fight, you know, uh, a higher tier heavyweight, um, like a, you know, I don't know, like a Brian Jennings or or something like that. Not Bellew, he, the reason that he's 
probably talking is because he, you know, he took out a faded hay twice. But I mean, those were ugly fights. They weren't really, in my opinion, very skilled. Um, and so, you know, like you guys said, he's just looking for the money. Um, but, uh, you know, Usyk, um, he's got a decent chin and he's got great feet and, you know, he can probably do pretty well at heavyweight because there's not a lot of what I would call athletic heavyweights, you know, that can do what he does. Um, but again, he comes up against like a wilder and gets hit with a shot, you know, it could be, it could be night lights out, but, uh, you know, I don't know how makeable that fight is. Your thoughts, Daniel. First off, Belly was never going to step in that ring with Usyk. I know he smells, he tends to smell money, but then that statement that he made with, is going to haunt him. I get why Usyk wants to do it, because technically, even though Breedis did have the belt, Breedis didn't actually beat Belly for the WBC Cruiserweight title. So there is a sentiment that there's still an uncrowned champion left to conquer. So that I understand. I completely get and I completely understand. I just don't see it happen. Because at least UK-wise, if one Tyson Fury is going to keep going along with this third ring circus he's calling the comeback tour, him and Belly will make a whole lot of money in the UK. And it would be a fight that pretty much wouldn't endanger anybody else's rankings in a way. It's not like beating this version of Tyson Fury would elevate Bellew to say, no, he's a rightful challenger to Joshua or Wilder. Or the same thing, beating Bellew wouldn't do much for Fury, just say, like, okay, you just beat a guy that was much smaller than you, and you technically beat a cruiserweight. So, for Uzik, there are some champions out there. Like, I want to see him, I want to mind seeing him with Fagawaki. I want him seeing him fight Dorticos. Like I said, that'd be a good fight, like, from an amateur standpoint to see how their styles mesh. And we have to remember, there's technically... A WBA belt out there. Brandon, I don't think he wants to stay in Russia to get it, but my boy Ledebev still has that belt. So there's fights for Uzik to make, and there's things to do as an undisputed champion. It just depends what direction he's going to go, because unfortunately, if you follow social media around the Ukraine, there's not a lot of love for Uzik, actually. Because of the fact he fought in Russia. But people keep forgetting that he didn't have a choice. Um, Wait, why, why are they hate on him? Because he fought in Russia? Yeah, because he fought um, Gassiev in Russia. What's he supposed to do? Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean... I mean, do they want to see him fight or do they want to see him sit on the shelf and, you know, make crazy demands? I mean, you know, he's, if anything, he's, you know, he's gone where, wherever the fights are and he's, he's at the pinnacle of his, you know, division. So, I mean, the only way he was able to do that was to take these fights. I mean, that's just stupid. Well, not it to is. mention, he, he represented at the end of every fight, he had the flag for the very country he came from with every fight. So, I'm with you on that. I mean, what can he do? Yeah, th that's the whole point. What can you do? Okay, the money was there. Yes, they didn't. Yes, and granted, this is more in the world of boxing super series than anything. You can't really announce a fight on a neutral site and then back down at the last minute because that's technically what the world boxing super series did. This wasn't supposed to be in Russia. Remember, this was supposed to be in Saudi Arabia. Would have been I mean, how, how many? How many big fights are in the Ukraine? I can't even remember the last big fight that's been in the Ukraine. If they wanted to go down, they could have just tried to go to Germany. But then probably Gassiev would have gotten some heat for fighting in Germany. We have to remember that this involves 
a political and a military situation between the countries in question of the two men, and it's making people act like idiots when it comes into it because it's true. Usyk had really, really no choice. He had no leverage. The money, the money was all in Russia. Right. So the, he had no choice. He had no choice. Now, well, does he have to defend it in Russia? No. He could defend it in Germany. He could defend it in Kiev. He could defend it here in the U.S. He could defend it in the U.K. It doesn't matter, but people have to stop and just think of the whole situation going in here because if you want to blame everybody, you have to blame the Sarlins, World Boxing Super Series, not sticking to your guns and say, no, we're going to have this final Saudi Arabia because we agreed to have this final Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but financial issues prevented that from happening. In terms of um, Usek, um, Nortikos is a good option at Cruiserweight, so is Lebedev. Um, the thing is, uh, you're going to fight Lebedev. Um, there's no reason to go to Russia, not now, after he's established himself as a king and won all the belts. Um, so if you're going to fight Lebedev, let him come to uh, Kiev or fight in a neutral spot in Germany, wherever. Uh, no need to go back there uh, to find him. Uh, in terms of heavyweight, it, it, it depends. Um, the Usek that I saw uh, this past weekend, Bellew's not beating. I don't care how he fights, Bellew's not beating. Um, an interesting option for me for Usek is if Parker beats Dillian White, and we'll talk about that fight later, um, that's not a bad matchup for Usek. Um, it would be a boxing contest. Um, Wilder, no. Um, Joshua, uh, no. Uh, but um, the fight I'm looking at for Usyk is possibly uh, Joseph Parker. Uh, should he beat um, Should he beat Dillian White uh, this weekend? So that's the fight I'm looking to. That's the fight I'm looking forward to for him um, at heavyweight. Let's move on and 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 talk about Cecilia Bracas. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the last name of the lady she fought, Ina. I, I, Ina, I'll just call it that, Ina or Ina, however you pronounce it. Bottom line is, Bo, uh, she got a 10-round decision win um, following her uh, rather tough bout against um, Reese last time out, which was she was knocked down on one occasion, hurt in another. Um, solid performance. Your thoughts? Um, well, first of all, you, you, you got to introduce her properly. Oh, dear. Um, this <laughs> is the undisputed, undefeated, most beautiful woman in all of combat sports, Cecilia Bracas. Uh, I wasn't surprised because the girl she fought had very, very, very little experience. Um, I think she was like 7-0 and or something like that. So the girl she fought had very, 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 very little experience. Uh, I think this was more of a stay busy fight, which she she does a lot of that. The ranking systems uh is it, is different in the women's division than it is in in the men's division like you know you have women that are undefeated and all of a sudden they're ranked and placed in to get a title so i i wasn't surprised by that performance that she gave um it was a performance that was needed uh because for fighters you have to have a short memory so she had to get over the performance that she had when she fought on hbo and she had to totally forget about that performance and then go out and do her job uh, in this fight right here, because you know she has a she she forever has a target on her back, that every time she gets in the ring, somebody's looking to take her down. So, uh, good solid performance, uh, good solid boxing. But uh, I'm, my biggest thing is she's starting she's starting to get up there where in that last performance we saw it, some of her skill set is starting to slip a little bit, and that comes with age. And uh, you know you we don't you're not supposed to talk about a woman's age, but she's 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 getting up there. So, you know at what point is she gonna just just you know really just call it quits because um like like we saw when she fought right here in the u.s on hbo you know there is uh that there were some weaknesses that somebody that, that that we saw and all it'll take is somebody at 154 or 160 decide to hey maybe i'll go down and, and try it and could be pretty successful at it i'll, I'll go to you uh jacob and daniel your thoughts on cecilia brackets and her uh win on the undercard of Usyk Gassiev, and um, talk about the future of uh, Cecilia Brackets. Where do you see her going? Um, I mean, it, it was a solid win. I mean, she was obviously, a, a, you know, 
a few classes above her opponent. Let me see if I can say her name. Sage Dakovskaya. Um, but, uh, you know, she, she was cracking her with rights and lefts. And um, I think even it wasn't the last round. She, I think she was almost about to put her out. Um, but I mean, she's not known for her knockouts, but you know, she just, she's just very skilled. She's very, you know, um, able to do what she, you know, dictate what she wants. And, and, you know, her opponent was, you know, this was only her what seventh fight or eighth fight. So, you know, she was thinking that because of Brock's last performance that she was going to get her. Um, but you know, that was just, you know, wishful thinking, um, as far as where she goes from here, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I think she's she might have said it before. I think in an interview that she's you know coming to the the end of her career and she's you know she's a unified uh, you know champion and she's defended the belts and she's you know done a lot. I think she wants to probably avenge her her performance against um, Reese. Um, so you know probably look to do that. Um, but other than that, I don't really see her. Uh, going up to you know and wait to challenge um, you know some of the bigger names. So um, you know it'd be okay if she called it a career and you know maybe had a couple you know big big money fights over in the in uh, Europe. Um, and you know she's done she's done awesome you know for the sport and you know her her legacy in my opinion is cemented. Your thoughts, Daniel? Uh, it was a solid win. I said it was a win that she needed in the in the terms of the fact that it's become a what's what you've done for the relay for me sport. And like I said, it did the job of removing the taste out of her US debut out of mouth. But there's really not much she can do now with Walter Wade. Because most of the big fight, most of the fighters that she can fight that could be more significant are either at least a couple divisions down, like in the case of Katie Taylor. Or they're at least two divisions up, like in the case of Hammer and Shields. So she's in a bit of a crossroads. She's done all she she's done all she needed to do at welterweight. She's proven that she's in She's still the undisputed champion at welterweight, and there's no one at the moment that can really consistently challenge her enough to take those belts off her hands. The only problem is, is somebody going to give her an advice saying, okay, you need to cash out, either uh, try to go down, face Taylor, or are they going to say, okay, you've done this. You need to step up uh, and challenge the winner of this fight because it's going to be the, your big cash-out fight, and it'll be in America. If it's Shields or Germany, if it's Hammer. That's where she is right now, but there's... If she, I'm with Jacob too. If she retired right now, there would be nothing but accolades for it right now. She would be right now. I could say with a certainty, if she retired today, five years from now, would be all a Casanata watching her be inducted to the Boxing Hall of Fame. So, Let's, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. Um, one final question before we move on to the HBO uh, uh, doubleheader. Let's just say she decides to have one big, big fight. What direction do you think she will go, up or down? Um, up meaning a possible fight with, say, a, a Clarissa Shields. Um, and I see Gus is joining us. I'll get him in a conversation in a bit. Uh, do you see up, say, a possibility of a fight with Clarissa Shields or Hammer? Or do you see her going down for a catchweight bout, say, against a Katie Taylor? I think the, the bigger payday would be up but i think that would be a bad decision i think she if she should do the taylor route that would that's my opinion but uh if she goes the bigger names are up i think 
the bigger names may be up, but is the money up there? Katie Taylor, at least you two talk in the UK market. Um, that's that's a tough one. I I I see what Jacob is saying. The bigger names is definitely up. You're right. You got um, Christina Hammer. You got uh, uh, um, uh, shoot. You got Christina Hammer. You got Maricela Cornejo. You got like you said, uh, Clar Clarissa Shields. But uh, I'm more leaning to what I think the money from a money factor would probably be Katie Taylor because of how the UK fans support. So, yeah, that, that's a tough one. Actually, I'm I'm of the mindset like what what I think Daniel alluded to earlier that um, you know uh, she should probably be looking at this maybe being her last year and, and retire because right now she's at the top of everything. She holds all the records. She's at the pinnacle for everything. So that would be the best move for me. Your thoughts, Daniel? Yeah, that, that's that's the whole risk of it. If, if she wants to stay in Europe, you can definitely go down and try to fight Katie Taylor. Or Taylor Care come up to a catchweight situation. If you want to redo the American if you try to redo your introduction to the American audience, because we, we have to admit that it did come up. And like I said, that debut did come up kind of haphazardly. It was it was just simply a way to remedy a bad situation. <laughs> but her probably standing, her sitting ringside, Watching Shield versus Hammer and then stepping up to the winner, that'd be a good situation because for either woman, whether it's Shields or Hammer, to say that you were the one that retired Cecilia Brackis would be an immense statement for both of them. It would be more and more for Shields because it would solidify her almost immediately. Hammer already has some of the accolades. You, it, this would just cement it. With Shields, this would launch her if she beat Brackus. And I think they would make the means to get that, to get it up there. So I, I would say up. I would say probably going up because you, maybe in the back of her mind, she wants to reintroduce herself to the American audience. Um, get Gus into this conversation. I want to go and I want to start to go with the conversation with Gus by going back to um, the first fight we discussed, which was Usek and, and, and Gossiel. Um, Gus, you uh, for years now here on Pound for Pound Boxing Report has been um, have been um, touting Alexander Usek. I believe in 2015 you named him as your uh, prospect of the year. Um, you basically said he was a, a champion in waiting from the early from early point of his career. Um, this is basically the culmination of what you've been predicting uh, from him. I'm giving you the opportunity right now uh, to talk about um, Usek and his uh, dominant win over um, Gassiev. And we discussed the possibility of, of Tony Bellew. The Usek I saw would box Bellew's shoes off. Uh, talk about the, uh, that bout, that potential bout as well. Hey, Mike, Jacob, Daniel, Mo, the old gents are doing well. Sorry, Mike, a little bit late. I didn't realize you were doing a show uh, today. But uh, no problem, no problem. Um, yeah, Mike, um, w when, when I saw him, when I saw him in the Olympics and uh, the World Series of Boxing, both of them were in London, um, him and Vasily was specifically the reasons why I went. I saw him back in, the, you know, I saw Usyk when he was competing at super heavyweight in the Olympics before he was fluctuating between super heavyweight and um, when he went down to, to light heavyweight. But the talent, you know, was there. You know, I was impressed with such a, you know, a large athlete and, and you know, his activity, footwork, um, skill, and he, and he just sort of continued to, you know, with the heavyweight ranks. And um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I mean, yesterday, on Saturday, 
what was impressive, Mike, was that you know I, he implemented you know the deficiencies which I was very vocal about after the Marius Breeders fight. Um, he departed company from uh, Serge Vatamonyuk, who who he brought in sort of post James Ali Bashir. Um, now Serge uh, has had has worked with other athletes, and he focuses a little bit less on footwork and more on punching and counter punching pretty much at short mid range um, but i think that that played very much into you know breeders is it's sort of you know territory and usik uh, sadly had forsaken the attributes which had given him a great deal of success both in the amateurs you know a long protracted career but also in the you know the professional ranks and being able to accelerate very quickly and challenge for a title but this fight um, you know, he, he went back, you know, Russ came in, Russ was developing, you know, a game plan, but he went back to, you know, the Ukrainian sort of boxing team coach, and, and that coach specifically works more on mental attrition. You know, talent is always there, and these guys are so good, Mike. Sometimes they don't even need a coach. Um, you know, they can, they can pretty much work independently, sort of autonomously. That's how... That's how gifted they are, and, and especially, you know, the coach who they work with, you know, they work on, you know, power chest, dealing with all of the intangibles and variables of fighting on the road against hostile crowds, against potentially biased referees. Um, and that's why this, you know, Usyk is able to go on the road as well. That, and, and you know, Mike, it's, it's a golf, massive golf of experience between the two. You know, he's had 300 fights. You know, he's fought in 50 jurisdictions, whereas Murat, you know, a baby at 24, you know, has only fought in, I think, three or four countries, 24 amateur fights, 24 professional fights. You know, Usyk has dealt with, as I mentioned, you know, light heavyweights, cruiserweights, super heavyweights, when he was, you know, when he lost against Costantino Russo in the, you know, the 2008 Olympics. So he's he, just so, so experienced. And yeah, Mike, it was very simple for him you know he went back to you know tremendous footwork murat gasif unfortunately was just unable to implement you know any sort of adjustments in the fight his head was on the center axis at all times he didn't he didn't he, he didn't cut off the ring sufficiently he also kept pivoting to his right you know setting him up with that jab at all times counter punching him exiting off Pivoting off to the right, hitting him with right hooks. Um, you know, it was a tremendous, tremendous performance. You know, he made a very, very good fighter. You know, a little bit green, yes, but he made him look vastly ordinary. Uh, started increasing his, uh, his output as well. In the 11th and the 12th round, Mike, this guy throws more punches. And, it, and it's a pattern synonymous with his career. Any 12 round fights, you see his workload increasing and increasing. Um, it's because he doesn't load up on his punches. It's it's a smooth flowing action, you know. It's a breaking down action, but there's power in the punches as well. You know, he busted up his nose very early, and then later on, when he was starting to sit down a little bit more on the punches, knew that Murat was a little bit disconsolate, despondent, a little bit disillusioned. Couldn't really figure out Usyk. Didn't have the skill, the hand speed, or the footwork. You know, Usyk didn't allow his feet to to set. And something that Usyk did very well is that what do power punches hate more than anything in the world is to be forced to be turned and turned regularly. And then, then you're resetting and then you're, you know, you're establishing your momentum, getting into range. So, you know, he, he gave him an ass whooping. And, uh, you know, one other factor I'd like to throw in, Mike, which is, is pretty much my theory, but I think what really gave Usyk the, you know, the motivation and a really a massive amount of injection was you know we, we talk about a ukrainian fighting against a russian in russia but if you recall when crimea was annexed by the russian federation from the ukraine you know that that political turmoil and, and the subsequent war and what the russian federation were doing in in the ukraine it affected usif massively and he made a number of comments how he would never surrender his ukrainian passport for a russian passport and that you know he affirmed 
that, that Crimea should always be a part of the Ukraine. And I, I, I think, you know, fighting in front of the Russian state, in front of the Russian public against, you know, a Russian sort of prized fighter, I think that gave him a tremendous amount of inspiration. I, there was no way he was going to be denied. And I think he wanted to make a, a statement as well. You know, whether we like it or not, politics and boxings, they interlace. You know, smaller, smaller nations, those are that have been subjugated, they tend to use sport, you know, to make, you know, to make political points as well. Yes, it was very much boxing, but I just think Usyk wanted to put on the masterclass. And, um, yeah, it was a, you know, fantastic victory. And, uh, you know, can't, can't wait to see him sort of move up to heavyweight. Um, thoughts on this, pro this, this early talk of about with uh, uh, David Hay. Like I said, like I said, Gus, I think um, the Usyk that we saw, he wipes the floor with hay. Your, your opinion? Uh, you, I, I, sorry. Bell, Bell, you, I think you mean. As I said, I, I, yes, uh, thanks for the correction, um, Jacob. To me, I, I think the Usyk that we saw um, this past weekend, the form, I think he wipes the floor with Bell, you. Your thoughts, Gus? Yeah, the reason being once again, Mike, is that although, you know, Bellew, we saw in the David Hay fight, was actually fundamentally so much better than David Hay. His shorter punches were far more effective, but but yeah, that was a David Hay who, who basically conned the entire United Kingdom public. Um, you know, he had, he had injuries, you know, I spotted those injuries from his, you know, public workout. He couldn't plant plant his foot. And that's what explosive punches do. If if you if they haven't got you know he's got no Achilles, he's got he's had rotator cuff surgery and bicep surgery. So if they're talking about power is the last thing to go, not necessarily. If your foundation, your body is not there to facilitate your power, then your power is irrelevant. And that's why Bellew was able to take those punches. So you got to judge that those fights in isolation, Mike. But Bellew is a Bellew likes to fight at, at sort of mid-range, short range. And Usyk, that, that's why he utilizes that jab. And that's why he fires, you know, three, 400 jabs. He doesn't allow a fighter to come anywhere near him. He doesn't want the fighter at short range. And that's what exactly Usyk will do against Bellew. He won't even allow him to get anywhere near him. But Bellew is a little bit smarter. I think he's obviously a lot more experienced than Murat Gassiev. Maybe he won't be as one-dimensional as and predictable, but um, I, I think Usyk can fight him on the back foot as well. Should Bellew decide to come forward, trying to push Usyk back, I think Usyk can 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 counter punch him. I think he, I think it'd be a reasonably you know decent fight, Mike. But no, I, I can't see Bellew prevailing in Liverpool. O2 anywhere, any weight, whether it's a catch weight, cruiser weight, heavyweight. Too inferior. Shoot, I think if Usek even decides to fight mid range in, mid range in, with his footwork, he'll still be too much for Bellio. Too much experience, too many angles, um, hand speed, wrong matchup all around. I just don't see it. Not based on what I saw. Um, let's move on to uh, talk about the doubleheader on HBO. I'll go to you, Daniel, on this one first. Uh, going to fight, um, I'll talk, excuse me, Alberto Machado. He fought um, his number one contender, Mensa. Uh, look, Machado, he, he, he dominated. Uh, Mensa was tough, uh, but you could see that uh, uh, Early on, um, Mensa, he was pretty much a no-hoper. Um, did I hear right, Daniel, that this was the first time that um, Mensa was paid for yes. a fight? Yes. In the 31 fights, this is the first fight he actually got paid. So by all technical accounts, that was his actual first professional fight. Because in all technicality, if you're not getting paid, you're not a professional. That's one aspect of it, and then there. You know, Who, who's the his whole... manager, Don King? Uh, yeah, it might be the it might be the African version of Don King, <laughs> but there's that, 
and they did HBO did try to play up the fact that his daughter died the month before. I just tried to give him something to persevere, but this was what it was. This was a showcase pretty much from Machado, and he did really, really well. Is it enough to for him to have him stand out right now in the Puerto Rican scene that doesn't really have now a clear-cut star or a clear-cut fighter who's among the best? Not really, but he puts himself back into the conversation among the top fighters in Puerto Rico, just based on the fact that he has a belt. No matter how badly the WBA screwed him out of the full status, but and but the whole aspect is they're gonna tr they're gonna try to build him up because obviously he's in a division where Durs Burchelt, Durs Cervante. And so there's challengers. There's even, I think he's still a turn to the pounds. Like uh, Gus's favorite family in the UK, the Smiths. I think Steven Smith is still fighting. So there's a chance for opponents there. So this is just a way to build them up. Going to just open up for everybody here who wants to talk about it. Please talk about the fight as well as the uh, future for um, Alberto Machado who's young and still developing, but um, you can see some talent there, no doubt. Anyone? I'll go if anyone else wants to. Please. All right. You know, Mike, um, what, what concerned me in that fight it was the same thing that concerned me in, in the Garcia and the Usyk fight. You know, Abel Sanchez didn't give more aggressive any instructions on any adjustments. And, you know, Mensa's corner, I think it was Stacey McKinley, um, very disappointed. I didn't, I couldn't detect any sort of deep affiliation between him and, and you know, Mensa. He didn't give him any instructions on, on how to cut the distance. And that was the perennial problem in the fight. He couldn't get near him, and uh, McKinley gave him absolutely no answer. He just kept relaying, echoing the same. Well, same McKinley, is, let's be honest. McKinley, going back to his days with Tyson, going back to his days with Obakar, to me, yeah. McKinley is a full, he's a full trainer. He's a full trainer. He's not much of a real trainer. Continue on, Gus. Yeah, and that, that I'm not sure how long uh, you know Mensa and him have been together, whether they worked previously. But from what I saw, I would I I would have reservations against that. The only instructions he he kept sort of relaying over was you know keep your hands up, keep your hands up. But what what the fuck is that? You know that's some of the most basic instructions that a that a fighter already knows. Um, you should have told him about you know trying to change levels, trying to get underneath. When you're fighting, a, you know, uh, a towering beast, you know, a five feet, 10 inch, 130 pound fighter, a bit of a phenom, that sort of Alexis Arguello sort of, you know, physicality in the ring. It, it's difficult when he's just raining down jabs and left hands with you. You know, when you're just trying to come in through the front door, you're not coming in through any side doors, you're not trying to dip down, you're not trying to upset his timing by fainting. I know it's difficult, but you know, Mensa was unfortunately just in the firing zone. Um, had no, didn't really bring his hands up after trying to fire, you know, retaliatory sort of right hands after, you know, Machado was landing, you know, straight lefts. You know, that right hook which took him down, that was a beautiful punch. Um, you know, that, that shows Mensa was just head a little bit wild just trying to throw wild punches you know not conscious his head was up um uh, defensively just just not unfortunately not conscious and uh but machado mikey this just didn't operate through the gears he could have stopped this guy a, a hell of a lot sooner um up against better opposition he can't fuck around like that we saw against the jezreel corrales you know he was very fortunate he was hurt he was losing the fight but his power got him out of danger you can't always rely on that power up, up against more disciplined, 
boxes and possibly even more explosive punches because his chin is he doesn't have the best punch resistance either mike so he's he's good but i don't think he's elite um once his opportunities are there he's got to learn he's got to have that killer instinct he's got to put him away a lot earlier um i don't know mike i i i like him he's got an exciting style you know he can punch with both hands it's, you know we know what his left hand can do but his his right hook you know which took out corrales and you know gave men trouble so an exciting fan friendly style but uh <laughs> maybe he's on borrowed time up against maybe a davis or somebody you know do, do, do you see let me quick follow up before i go to everybody else do you see some similarities in terms of strength vulnerabilities to mangia who we will talk about in a little bit yeah yeah i do yeah 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 I'm going to go to uh uh, uh bo uh jacob any quick comments on um machado's win over mensa um i'll go um i think you know uh, gus gus put it you know pretty pretty well. you know when he had uh mensa down in that first round with a with a vicious you know right hand and and mensa looked all but done um i agree with gus i mean you got to finish you got to finish that guy you you can't be messing around i think if he fights someone like a um uh who, who's the guy you mentioned earlier uh burchell i i think Burchell would would mop the floor with him. Um, Burchell beats him, and um, from what I've seen, David Tank Davis would beat him. Davis would knock him out. Oh yeah, D Davis would would probably bull rush him. Um, but you know, he you know he he's he's got some power. He, you know he's you know he's exciting, but uh, I don't think that he's gonna be. I don't know. I don't think he's gonna hold on to that belt very long if he if he steps up his competition. Um, you know. He just uh, he has a lot of I think deficiencies and there if people watch the film and have the right game plan he he can be exposed easily I think um, I don't think Bo's here I think he may have some technical issues or stepped away so we're going to go to the main event of that HBO doubleheader um, Jaime Munguia, um who's coming off a of destruction of Saddam Ali while well, he fought his um, number one contender, I believe it was Liam Smith. Look, we didn't give Beefy Smith um, much of a hope um, previewing the fight last week, but um, to Smith's credit, uh, he made this a fun fight. Um, and the reason I asked Gus the question, the comparison between um, Machado and Mangia was because Machado shows, shows some um, flaws in his win over Mensa. Similarly, Munguia, well, put it this way, Smith exposed some flaws in Munguia. Uh, Munguia, he has to work on his defense. Uh, Smith hit him a lot of counter punches, especially uh, right hands and left hooks. Um, Magia is an exciting fighter, very good body puncher, energy, tons of energy. Of course, he's 21 years old. Went very well to the body, pretty much dominated this fight. And I'll go back to you, Jacob. But again, um, Smith, um, <laughs> this was a fun fight. Uh, Smith was competitive. He was competitive throughout. Um, like I said, he hit, hit Magia with some surprisingly number of counter punches. Um, the DDT that Mangia gave him was fun. Um, the denture pulling, I think it was from Mangia's grandma was fun as well. Uh, your thoughts on the in, the affair? Um, you know, I agree with you. You know, it was an exciting, fun fight. Um, I didn't give Smith much of a chance after what Mangia did to um, Ali. Um, and, you know, the last Smith performance, I can't remember if his last performance was against Canelo. Um, but, uh, you know, he, you know, he got stopped there, uh, with body shots, but, uh, yeah, I had a friend, you know, I was, we're, you know, when we watched the fights, you know, we kind of text back and forth and he was saying that, you know, Mugia is a KO waiting to happen. Um, he, he gets hit way too much. I know he's a young kid, but he's got to tighten up that defense. Um, it, it, it had me first to think though, like, he was an opponent that was, um, you know, 
brought up for uh, Golovkin. Um, so that would have been an interesting fight, you know, knowing what we know now, because um, we know he's got some pop and 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 uh, you know he he's you know he's he's willing to fight, but uh, you know I don't know what kind of punch resistance he has because I mean Smith to me is no world beater, um, but you know he very much similarities to uh, I think he's better than Machado, but uh, I think similarities there were you know the defense deficiencies and. Um, wanting to, you know, kind of that Mexican spirit of wanting to brawl rather than, than be smart, um, you know, could take years off his, uh, his uh, fighting, you know, uh, uh, lifespan. Um, so, you know, I think he needs to change some of those, those tendencies, um, you know, with him being as young as he is and, you know, he can, you know, uh, fight a lot longer, but, uh, I worry if he comes up against somebody that has um, uh, some movement that could take a punch and, and that can definitely land some punches with some power, you know, what's going to happen to him. Okay. Uh, guess I'll go. I think both still out. One thing I'll say about this fight now, I think G- Jacob, the, I think the last major fight that uh, Dean Smith had was in the Battle of the Liams. I think it was a Liam Walsh or Liam Williams. I forgot. Williams, Williams. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. He had he had back to back. Well, he had like Cas Castaku and a couple uh, Liam Williams. Yeah, like I said so he, he's been he's been busy enough to do it in, but it's actually a good test of Mungia face now. Rather than a soft touch, because Liam Smith did expose that gaping defensive hole in the right hand for Munguia. And it reminded me of much of how much Jared Hurd actually can eat punches from time to time. And I think that comes from the belief that Munguia has in his show. At the fifth, at the fourth and fifth round, when he started to pick it up, that he believes that his power will likely save him in one aspect of it. And it didn't the fourth round. Like for the first three or four rounds, there was a you could probably see a small chance that you could see Liam Smith pulling in the upset just based on skill. But then the fifth round came when he started landing those body shots. Started landing the left hook at will, and then the sixth round he landed nice one that knocked Sniff down, and it just showed throughout the fight that he still was getting hit with the right hand, but he weathered the storm. He started landing to the body, took some steam out of Smith's punches, and ultimately countered him well with left hooks and right hands. Which ultimately like, he won in the fight. Like it was, a, those cards were respectable. But the best part I liked about it was that Munguia was honest. He didn't try to say it's a tough fighter. I'm not trying to knock him out. Like and over my team, he was honest. He said, "I'm green. Like there's things I need to fix." So he understands how beneficial that fight was actually for him. Now I'll say for what's next. I didn't mention the name. Like they're two fighters that technically fight in the same way. And judging the way that Mungia ballooned up in this fight, he he pretty much was a cruiserweight in that fight. Him and Hurd wouldn't be bad. Because they're both almost right around that same skill level where they're tough, they're young, they can hit. Oh, and that's fire of the it. year worthy. That's fire of the year worthy. Yes. Don't 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 wear a white shirt at ringside if you're watching that bell. Oh, dude, no, no. That people know how I felt about Francisco Vargas with the San Leno Salido stop up. It has that potential. Because both of these guys have enough lapses on defense where they're just gonna go to war. But that's Is that a, even a makeable fight though? That's the whole point. If they can make it, but I think you could probably make it with if you have Munguia's Mexican promoter. 
handle negotiations because I think he works with Heyman from time to time. And it just depends whether or not you want to have to fight, how soon you want it after we, we know Heard wants to fight Charlo next. So it had to depend to see where that fight is because if it's against those champions, and we have to look at it, the IBC is Jermel. He's not ready for Jermel. One plan to cook here. Just as skill wise, Jermel would toy with it, with Mungia. Your thoughts, Gus? Oh, man. I think Liam Smith's uh, defiance uh, cost me a tremendous amount of money. <laughs> if you think my disdain for him, which is obviously well documented, Was, was acute before. I mean, it's just magnified tenfold. That he was, he was eleven to eight against to be knocked out, Mike. Um, you know, I was, I was on the verge of a six-fold accumulator. You know, everything else was perfect. Oh, man. Um, can you say? What I'll say about M Mungia, Mike, is that. You know, the, the defensive sort of deficiency that you know everybody is, is talking about. Yes, you know, a very a very young fighter still, you know, twenty one, whatever he is, but I think in this fight, Mike, he, he realized very early that Liam Smith's power was absolutely fuck all. So he was just teeing off, you know, foreign extravagant flamboyant hooks from so far out, it was almost field goal range. Um, but he was surprisingly quite accurate. You know, I think his power punches were about 40% or something. Um, crazy style. You know what sometimes he does is that he doesn't bring his elbows out. I know it's to a right angle. It's just literally pulling it back so his arms are relatively tucked in when he fires that, that sort of uppercut from from long range and that can be quite difficult to somebody who's got a high guard because it's actually coming underneath so he can penetrate you know the guard and, and, and Liam tends to operate in that high guard um, but Liam was catching him obviously you know in between with him firing those hooks because Liam Smith is essentially a counter puncher and Liam tends to fight at, at sort of short range that's his distance uh, but Liam Smith has got atrociously bad footwork very slow um, that coupled with no power so he was never really going to make any indentations on on, on Jaime, whose stamina was also very good we know that power punches if you if you're missing regularly as well you know that that tends to deplete your tank now he was missing a fair bit as well uh, but he, he just kept that high work rate kept Get firing those crazy hooks, unbelievably aggressive. It was a, you know, I, I, I was loving Liam Smith getting punished, Mike. You know, uh, but I was getting a little bit worried as the rounds were coming down. I was thinking, fuck me, the Euro signs are slowly disappearing here. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was no way I was going to take a hedge position on that fight, <laughs> but. That's what happens, you know. You just get sometimes you just get embarrassed by some of the most, uh, you know, predictable sort of, sort of a reverse trend on 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 the particular fight. And, uh, yeah, you know, what can you say? You know, I mean, Liam Smith. You know, I bet he regrets, you know, whatever injury he suffered when he was, you know, Saddam Ali's mandatory because I think he would have had a reasonably good chance. You know, against a you know a smaller fighter, he doesn't obviously carry as much foul firepower. So circumstances fucked him up there. But uh, yeah, he got a he got a beating. But you know, I'm sure HBO will bring him back. You know, they 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 probably see him as a, some sort of a, as a punch bag, as a barometer, as a litmus test for some of these other fighters who 
you know, they're promoting on the A side. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Mungia, um, you know, he was, I think he was reasonably well spoken after the fight, Mike. I, I detected a little bit of, you know, not not too much arrogance, not too much bravado. There seemed to be some some down to earth talk there. Um, he looks like a character, you know, who you know will train, will will try and implement, you know, take instructions and try and develop. That's that's what I gauged, but I could be absolutely wrong. Um, he's got time, but size, you know, he, he's rehydrating too much. Um, that's a dangerous sign. And I've been I've been reading a study about fighters rehydrating 20, 23 pounds and what what it does, Mike, and it's it's not good what I'm reading, you know, potential brain cavity injuries because the brain it take it takes far longer for it to rehydrate the fluid it needs. It can't do it within twenty four hours. So so I'm always worried about fighters who are rehyd cutting way too much and rehydrating. Uh, I, I think eventually that's going to lead to, you know, brain injuries and it's going to make them more and more susceptible and their punch resistance is going to go. So I would prefer him to fight at his, his ultimate weight. Um, given that he's young, I think he's he can cut weight very quickly, go back up. He probably thinks, fuck it, you know, it's no big deal to me. I've got the elasticity, the flexibility in my body, but long run, it might not help him. Uh, in, in, indeed, indeed. And um, I think he has admitted as much that he's basically uh, a middleweight who's coming down to uh, junior middleweight. And so he'll probably move up um, in the future. And I wouldn't be surprised. And HBO has already basically hinted at um, a possible fight between him and Canelo down the line. And for Smith, um, you're right. Uh, at the very least, not only did he put up a good fight, but he's going to get some more fights um, um, in the future. Wouldn't be surprised to see him back on um, HBO um, if not become more of a popular fighter on a domestic level. Uh, let's move on. Uh, going to open it Hello, up to Mike. every. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Bo. Yeah. Um, you know the. I think you guys was talking about it. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Mugia outside of him being green. I think that the only difference is when he fights because you guys are talking about Jared Hurd. I think the only difference is Hurd would be able to do something that Liam Smith didn't do, which is make him pay for the misses. Um, there was a lot of punches that were you know kind of wide and kind of wild and. Uh, and he that got him off balance, but Liam Smith, because of the power, just you know, wasn't making him pay. And I think Jared Hurd would make him pay for those misses. Um, the Charlo fight, like somebody said, would be a, would, would, would be way different. I think the best one from a from a fan standpoint and from excitement would be Hurd. But you know, listen, let's give the kid credit. I give him he has that he's selling the end to a guy who's just become a champion, he has that heart. Of, of a champion he has that will because uh the first couple of rounds Liam Smith came out and tried to jump on him he endured and uh you know and he fought his way you know all the way to a uh, decision I think he wanted to try to get Smith out of there before Carnelo Alvarez because he was trying to use that as a barometer of how to beat him I give Smith some credit and Gus is right HBO is gonna is gonna try to use Smith as a guy who because of the way that he fought they're gonna try to use him as a guy that you know, as a barometer for some of these other up and coming guys, but I, I, you got to give uh, Jaime Munguia credit. I mean, uh, he is green, but he was an opportunity there. He took it, and uh, he looked what I thought he would look against a bigger guy instead of fighting a smaller guy, like when he fought Saddam Ali. And and you're right, Mike. I think um, I think pretty soon here, within another year or two, this 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 kid's going to be up at 160 pounds. Um, let's move on to the news here. Uh, going to open it up for everyone here. I'm uh, going to focus on the uh, World Boxing Super Series. We talked about it when it came to the Cruiserweight Final with Usek and Garcia. Going to go back to that to um, that again, specifically as the WBSS announced their uh, pairings uh, for the Junior Welterweight and the Bantamweight Tournament. Going to go over it right quickly at 140. Going to have Regis Progress going to fight Terry Flanagan. Uh, Josh Taylor going to fight Ryan Martin. Um, Kiro Relic is going to fight uh, Troy Inoski. And Baranch is going to fight Anthony Wright. That's at 140 pounds. At 118, Ryan Burnett fighting Nonito Donaire. Naoya Inoue is fighting Juan Carlos Payano. Um, second quarterfinal. Zolana Tete is fighting um, Aliwan, uh, Mikhail Aliwan. Um, the third quarterfinal and the final 
quarterfi quarterfinal, excuse me, is um, Emmanuel Rodriguez fighting Jason Maloney. Uh, just going to open up to anybody. Well, I'll just start with you, Gus. Uh, your thoughts on the quarterfinal pairings for both the uh, junior welterweight and the bantamweight tournament. I will say before you begin, I'm looking at this bantamweight tournament um, with the exception of the Solano Tete Aliwan bout. Um, the rest of the uh, matchups are um, very, very good. The, the bantamweight tournament for me in particular, that's a fire. That's that's fire. Uh, um, that's a fire tournament right there. I love it. Yeah, the, um, no surprise, you know, with Ryan Burnett, you know, the number one seed, uh, just simply by virtue of being a former sort of, you know, unified champion. But uh, I think in, in this tournament, he's, his seeding will be, you know, superficial. Um, no surprise, you know, he selected, you know, Nonito, a veteran pretty much is losing pretty much every fight coming back down to to probably his his better weights but given that he's the ages have piled on maybe he's fighting natural aging and sort of the weight coming up so and plus Nonito is already fought in Northern Ireland so he's going back there as well um, yeah the, the, the first rounds Mike is it's it, a little bit of an anti-climax we know I think I think the main seeds are Pretty much going to go through. Payona will probably go to Japan, so uh, in a way, you know, obviously has a chance to, you know, acclimate fully to, you know, to to, to bantamweight. Now Payono fought, fought some reasonably good fights in the past against Rashi Warren, but he's probably seen better days now. Um, so I'd expect an in a way to, you know, progress and and, and probably stop Payano uh, relatively early but he does have a reasonably good chin so um, plus he's got a, 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 a quite an, a sort of an unorthodox style as well um, not too sure about um, you know the Lani's opponent um, young Russian um, I f I'm trying to think I think it's the father who may have had some drug testing issues post the Olympic if I'm not mistaken, if it's the same guy I'm thinking about. Um, so I, I'm going to have to have a look, a little, little bit more of a of, an, of a detailed look with him. But um, so that, yeah, the, the, the first one's Mike. Nothing. I think nothing. Rodriguez. I think Rodriguez and Maloney is a low key better matchup than people give him credit for. Maloney can fight. Yeah, Rod Rodriguez is a fighter who I really like. I think. I think technically and fundamentally, he looks probably that you know very sound, sound fighter. Uh, beautiful jab, beautiful left hand, as we know with these Hispanics, they have good straight right hand as well. But he's got to he so he fights so relaxed, you know, at a beautiful pace. But him, him as well, Mike. He's he's maybe an, a guy who's got to try and learn to work up and up the gears. And what a beautiful sort of tournament there is for him to showcase that talent and we'll see but yeah the next the semi-finals and the finals but the 140 tournament mike um you know i was thinking what the fuck is terry flanagan doing there you know <laughs> i would have thought victor postal was would have been a better participant especially after that josh taylor fight you know i thought he would have been a you know better and uh terry for his uh, his sins of boring us you know he's got, you know, re, re just so whether that fight happens in New Orleans or in London, I'm I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, um, well, you know, Re just doesn't really have much of a defense. But Terry Flanagan doesn't doesn't have any firepower. So you, I think we're going to see the same Re just progre. He doesn't really give a fuck about defense and just you know just try and knock Terry out very very quickly. But for me, for me, Mike, and I and I talked about this on Bo show, uh, made a comment on it on Bo show a little while ago. A dream fight I wanted to watch about a year ago was Kirill Relic against Ivan Baranchek. You know, for me, stylistically, that's just war written. You know, a, a fight of the year, and and Relic for me, Mike, if if Relic's punch resistance is there specifically, if you can take body punches from an inner way, whatever. 
he's going to be a very hard man to stop at 140 because of his work rate, Mike, and his power. He's just, he's just fucking relentless, Mike. Um, so I think he's got a, a, a very good shot. We know Barthelemy did put him down, I think, with a body shot, but obviously there were some borderline low blows, which may have, which may have made him a lot more susceptible then to a, to a body shot that which would, you know, cause him to go down. So, but uh, yeah, Relic I really like. You know, Josh Taylor is a very exciting and improving fighter as well. He's already structuring a very good resume at, at, at such, you know, fights of a great level of maturity as well. You know. So, yeah, two, two fantastic tournaments, so many great fights. Can't wait, Mike. It's going to be amazing. Um, Bo, uh, Jacob, Daniel, your thoughts, your reaction to the quarterfinal uh, pairings when it comes to the uh, World Boxing Super Series uh, and weight and junior welterweight tournaments. You know, uh, I'm with you, Mike, about the 118. And I'm also with Gus about the one fight that I'm I'm, I'm want to watch is that uh, Relky, uh, and uh, what's the guy's name fight that that fight's gonna be fire. I want to see that. <laughs> I think uh, to Gus's point, one of the problem with with Regis Progre because I I've, I've talked to him is once he realizes you can't hurt him, he goes into full Earl Spence mode where he just like you say he just okay there's no point in me even trying to be defensive. I'm just gonna walk through you because you can't hurt me. But um. I'm excited about that because I'm hoping the finals of that 140 is Regis and Josh Taylor. And I'm like, that's, that's going to be awesome there, but 118. Uh, and I know Gus, not too high on the guy, but I think Juan Carlos Payano, you're going to, you know, I know I better not take him lightly. He's a former world champion. Um, <clears throat> he's a former world champion. I thought he actually beat, Rashid, uh, I, I thought the second fight he he beat Rashid Wallace. I mean Rashid Warren. I thought he beat him, but uh, don't take him don't take him lightly. I think that's going to be a better fight than most people's giving him credit for. And then Mike, I'm with you. I think the sleeper of that 118 pound is going to be that Emmanuel Rodriguez and that uh, uh, Maloney fight because, like you said, Maloney can definitely fight. So I'm excited about the 118 because of the names that we have in there. You got Ryan Burnett, Jelani Tate. And uh, of course, you know, now we know it and, and I can just see, um, uh, you know, uh, Ryan Barnett and Anoye matching up or Anoye and Tay Tay. It's, 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 it's just awesome. So I'm excited as you, I think whoever wins the 118 pound tournament, even though one of the belts is not involved because I think one of the belts are vacant, but whoever wins that tournament is the man of that division in my eyes. And I'm excited about 140 because, and, uh, 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 well, Maurice Hooker was supposed to have been in it, but he's not in it now. But I'm excited about the 141 because it'll get us closer to trying to find out because whoever wins there will come out with two belts. So it gets us closer to trying to find out, okay, who's the man, you know, who's the new man of this division. So I'm loving the matchups. I think the thing about the WBSS tournament is it's uh, it it the formula for it works as long as they have the right fighters because the super middleweight <coughs> tournament is losing a lot of luster only because of the fact you had an injury that took place, I think, with George Grove. So its ability to uh, uh, probably uh, get some, you know, get some traction going was probably hurt by that. But when you look at 118, and then another thing about it is um, people are going to be more excited now because of what we saw with Usyk and uh, and um, Gassiev and how that tournament turned out. People will be more excited about the 118-pound tournament, about the 140-pound tournament. Tournament. They're generally low to lower division, like 118. People don't really look at. So uh, Maloney and Rodriguez is what I'm got. What I'm excited about. I think um, I think Juan Carlos Payano is going to give more of a fight than what people realize against now you know he's going to he's, he's going to test him. And then the um, the the Relke fight is. Um, I'm 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 dying for that one too. Uh Jacob Daniel, your thoughts. Yeah, not not much more to add. I mean, it's I'm super excited. You know, I was you know very impressed with the the way the first two um you know divisions have kind of shaped out. I know um uh you know Groves has been <laughs> tweeting a lot of smack about when they're going to make the fight. And I believe that they're coming up on an announcement pretty soon, or they have already made it, um, that uh, they set that fight up. Um, and so we'll get a, f uh, a finale of that. But, uh, um, you know, 
I think they're doing the best they can. You know, all they can do is say, hey, we have a tournament. It's open, you know, invitation. So, you know, if you want to get into this tournament, you know, submit your name and, and you know, but, it, you know, easier said than done in the sense of, you know, all, all that different stuff. So, but, I mean, I think, you know, these, these two weight classes are going to produce some exciting fights. Um, uh, yeah, more excited for 118 uh, for sure. Um, if, you know, the fights that I want to see, you know, happen. Um, and I kind of like uh, this format that they do where they do the drafting. I, I, I think that's, that was interesting how they, you know, they basically pick who they want to fight and um, based off a draft. So I, I kind of like that, you know, it puts like something different than, than, than your, you know, your normal, just, you know, make a fight. So I'm excited. Reaction to the quarterfinal announcements, Daniel. All right, let me first start at junior middleweights. First of all, Regis Proga is going to be my boy when he disposes of Terry Flanagan. Most people actually felt that he should have picked Ryan Martin. Some, some say that would have been the safer choice. But it's kind of smart doing it well because of the way they paired up because Proga beats Flanagan. And Ryan Martin beats Josh Taylor. Then you have an all-U.S. semifinals. So from an ad revenue standpoint, from a TV standpoint, then you have then a U.S. network has to pay attention because you got two American fighters. Now Ivan Voranchik versus Anthony. Yeah, that's going to be interesting because Voranchik is a mandatory challenger, but. It is very, very interesting in this because he's still a little bit of green. And if it wasn't for the fact that he was fighting the much lighter guy in Peter Petrov before, some of those deficiencies him being green would have been shown. And but probably the fight that I'm looking forward to the most just because of the work rate of this guy, Relic versus Troyanovsky. Because for Tarnowski, this is going to be a little bit of redemption. He's going to try to, like I said, redeem himself from that knockout that he suffered by Julius and Dango. And we know Relic can go as far as work rate. And, it's, and it can shape up to be a U.S. versus Eastern European final, which I would not mind at all. <laughs> because... All these guys are pretty good now. When it comes to the bantam weights, that's where be, that's where I'm gonna pay my attention to because Payano versus Sanui is gonna be a fun fight. I know when people saw in the draft fight, some people try to say that Payano looked a little bit scared. I'm like, yeah, I've not seen Connor Carlos Payano fight. <laughs> that dude will go balls to the wall. <laughs> When he has to, and he's going to have to against Nui. Rodriguez says with Malone, he's going to be a decent fight. Let's say Rodriguez is, like I said, one of those cha champions that's going to try to elevate himself, be the top fighter in Puerto Rico. Zelani Tete versus Mikhail Yogan, that's a fight I pretty much expect is just a way for Tete to secure himself in the, se in the semifinals. Ryan Burnett versus Donito Donaire. This is going to be interesting for Donito Donaire because he's been fighting that featherweight for, what, past two, three years at the least? Yeah. So you're fighting that to send the least. Now you're going back down again to Bantamweight. Granted, that's the division that a lot of people recognized you for. A lot of people remember your name for. But at, at this stage of his career, I want to see how he looks at that weight against the fighter that is not a pushover in Ryan Burnett. So that's going to be an interesting setup. But we all know the way this is going to be set up. Look, the final has to be, unless somebody throws, throws something on the apple cart, we know the final is going to be Tete anyway. They structured it this way to make sure that Tete and Inoue don't have to face himself in the semifinals. 
I mean, Don't be too sure about that, though, because you know this is why this is why they fight. You know, there's always in kind of like you know with the NCAA tournament, there's always seems to be you know some upsets and some surprises. So, you know, we could we could see something. You know, when when these guys fight and you know if they put their whole heart into it, and you know it's any anybody's game if they have the right game plan. That well, that's the main thing. I expected it, but that's why I said in the beginning. You better be better not count out Payan out of a fight. Does it, like I say I don't I don't see this thing that people saw where like oh Payano looks scared in the draft. Did I didn't see that. I know how Payano fights, <laughs> so that's gonna be a very very fun fight <laughs> coming into it because Inoue is gonna come to impress. So. It's Jacob's right that anything could turn in, but it's shaping up to be that probably my favorite out of two that's going to be this, uh, the junior welterweight dub because there's so good potential from other fights going into it. And I'm pretty high, even though, like I said, so I think there was, I'm pretty high. I am ranching. Uh, yeah. Um, for me, uh, the fight I'm looking forward to at 118 is, um, uh, Rodriguez and Maloney. Uh, I said it before with Gus. Um, I think that's just a low key, very good fight. I think Maloney is a really good uh, challenger, mandatory challenger for uh, Rodriguez, who won the title in impressive fashion. But uh, again, he, he's still young. He just won the title. And um, Maloney, personally, I feel is going to give him a bit of a handful. Um, in a way, in Payano, uh, I'm going to give, in a way, the advantage there. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Part of me wants Donaire to beat uh, Ryan Burnett because I just don't think that much of him. And I just think Tete will just handle business against um, allowing uh, progress. I think progress will beat Flanagan and beat Flanagan uh, pretty easy. Uh, Taylor Martin, that's a good matchup. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I may go with Taylor there. I may I'm go with sure. Taylor there. I'm not sure. Excuse me. I'm hearing that echo. Excuse me. I'm hearing that echo. Let me fix it. Um, um, Baranchik. Baranchik. I'm going with him in that matchup. I'm going with and, him in that matchup. And, and I think Kill Relic, Relic is a really good I know he lost I know recently, but I think he's just a really, really solid player. Solid player. That you don't know about Troy you don't Nasca. Know about Troy Nasca. Following, following his. Uh, Lost to lost to his um first his, round uh, knockout first round knockout lost so there you go lost, so there you go going to going to go go I just make one other quick point Mike uh huh uh huh just regarding the uh, Ryan Ryan Burnett Mike the number one seed in the Vanderbilt uh, tournament now he his style Mike it, it, it's almost like a, a, a cancer which is spreading. You know, in the United Kingdom, amongst young fighters now, what I've seen from a lot of these young prospects, and you know, Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren and some of these other, I don't think trainers are focusing as much on defense. I see a lot of these fighters who are very good coming going forward, but they have no back foot game. And with Ryan Burnett in particular, and it's and it's a cancer with all Adam Booth. It's synonymous with him is this hands down style i call it the gunslinger at the okay corral inside the pocket you, you, him josh kelly they have their hands down and they're leaning back mike you know relying on their athleticism to try and evade punches that's a very very dangerous style and, and I, I saw josh kelly taking taking some punishment in his previous fight and i think ryan Burnett. He's just a victim, and I think he's going to get clipped and clipped badly inside the pocket. At this high level, you can't be fighting like that. I don't give a shit how quick and how, you know, your reflexes, what they are. You're up against, you know, the best of the best in this tournament. Um, guys who will upset your, you know, who will upset your timing with their feints and, and vice versa. You know, they're very shrewd, calculated fighters, and... Uh, no, nah, I, I, he's going to be a casualty of war, Mike, and it's going to be down to that, to that gunslinging style, hands down, 
happen. And me and school, as we in school say, you say, hands down, man down. I, I just don't like. I, I just don't like. And I think the echo is coming from you. Coming from you. From you ain't got. So you ain't got. So you may have to mute. But for me, the thing I don't like about Burnett is that he has a tendency to. He he he. To me, he he doesn't fight inside. He grabs and holds whenever a fighter gets close to him, and 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 that makes for ugly fights. And I think Progress is smart enough and patient enough to sense when. Um, no, 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 no. I'm um, I'm not. I'm thinking. I'm 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 confusing tournaments here. But I think as Burnett fights higher caliber fighters. Uh, because Donaire, you know, Donaire is up there in age, even though I, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind him taking Burnett out. I think against the anyway, I think uh, against the Rodriguez, I think against a Tete, they would take advantage of the fact that when Burnett gets close to you, he has a tendency to grab and hold, and they can step back, step around, since when he starts to grab and hold, and when he does it, uh, just count his shoes off. And um, yeah, and if Donaire was a little bit younger, with his tendency to see things in pot shot like he used to when he was a younger fighter at 118, he would really he would really catch Burnett doing that. I think he would knock him out. But at this age, um, the wear and tear on his body, uh, we just do not know. Let's move on to um, other news developments here. Um, going to you, Bo. Uh, I wrote about this for Three Kings Boxing. I also wrote about it for Pound for Pound uh, Boxing Report for my blog. Um, Kazuta Ioka, uh, former champion at 105, 108, 112. Uh, last year, he announced his retirement from the sport. Um, at the time, a lot of folks felt that because he was uh, newly married, he's married to a pretty famous uh, a Japanese uh, a female singer out there, uh, that because he's married, because he's quote unquote happy and content, uh, that was the reason for him uh, retiring. Um, as a result, um, his father did not like it. Um, there was some dissension in his family um, that was well known over in Japan. Well, uh, last week uh, in the press conference in Tokyo, uh, Ioka announced that he's coming out of retirement. Not only that, he has signed a deal with um, Loffler and 360 Promotions. And as a kicker, he's going to make his, his comeback fight would be his U.S. debut on Superfly 3. Uh, so a lot of news regarding um, Ioka and his future. And he's also going to be campaigning at 115 pounds. So a load of junior bantamweight division has even got that much stronger. Your reaction to the return um, of Kuzuto Ioka? Uh, um, man, you know, it's... it's, it's <laughs> Uh, my reaction, my first reaction to it was Suzuka Ioka one and Keith Thurman negative 50. That was my <laughs> first reaction. <laughs> that, was my first reaction. <laughs> that was my first reaction to it. Um, I'm glad he's back because uh, he was young. Um, maybe what it maybe he needed some time off. I, I think sometimes a lot, a lot, a lot of people forget, man, when you're boxing, man, you, you're doing this. At such a young age and the constant grind and wear and tear on your body look at um uh one of the uh, uh royal brothers took some time off came back and won a fight that, that that nobody thought he could win so i think you know the time off could, probably could have did him good from a mental and physical standpoint um and if it helped him find his hunger we'll 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 see we'll soon find out now if it's a situation where he's just coming back because of the pressure from his family uh, then he's going into the wrong division if he's not coming back mentally strong and, and hungry, because like you just said, that 115, that, that, that division that he's coming back to that division is no freaking joke. You're talking about Kaya Fai. You're talking about Jordan and Cajas. You're talking about run Versailles. Then of course the challenges in Estrada, Roman Gonzalez is still up there. McWilliams Arroyo, who, who I just saw, who I just, who I just named, uh, you know, uh, you know, Donnie Nietes. That division is no joke. That's no. That's not a division to play around with. So, I'm interested in seeing what version of him come back. Is this the version of him that you know was giving a couple of lackluster performances just before he left out of the door, or is it going to be the version of him that I remember him as the hungry dude that was just 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 looking to take take your head off? 
<coughs> so <clears throat> it's going to be interesting to see that. But it this is a big move, him coming back and then coming back to 115, like I said. I, uh, I think maybe I'm just even looking at it. I'm like, who does he fight when he come back at 115? Does he try Luis Concepcion? That's still a pretty good fight. You know, Takumi, uh, uh, Takumi Inoue, uh, you know, Coco Eto. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, but whatever it is, if he's not serious, we'll, we'll find out real soon because that's a division where even the challengers can knock you off. And uh, one more um, final note on this, and I'll go to you, Jacob, and you can follow up, Daniel. Um, after all the news I've given of um, Ioka, he's moving his base of operations from um, Japan uh, to L.A. Uh, to prepare for this bout. The question is, given that he's moving his base of operations to the United States, Will that include his father? I don't know yet. So your reaction to the return of Kazuto Ioka and the fact that he's going to be on Superfly 3? Well, I mean, good for me. I mean, because, uh, you know, the Superflies have been excellent, uh, you know, series, we'll, we'll call it. And, you know, um, I believe it's on September 8th, so I'll, I'll most likely be there. Um, or I'll, at least I'll try try to be there. But... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't know as much um, as maybe some of the guys on the panel about uh, that situation. I know that there were some some problems with the father, but uh, um, you know, moving your base, you know, that far, I, I don't know. I mean, it really depends on what kind of relationship they have, and you know, you know what what his goals are, and and if that gels with what you know his father. Um, thanks, you know, so I, I'm, I don't have, unfortunately I don't have that much information, but I mean, I mean, excited to see him, um, you know, and see, you know, hopefully has that, that drive and that passion still. And, and, you know, we see a good fight on uh, September 8th. Your thoughts, Daniel. What I found surprising was that the move from Japan to the U S because in a way, that, that is an effective surrender, an, uh, an effective acknowledgement that in new way has surpassed them as far as being a marquee attraction. So he's, doing, so he's doing a good thing where not only is he moving his bases to another country, but he's moving it to a division that is still red hot. And if, like I said, if he's still looking... If he's still looking at it new way, he's saying, I'm standing in a division that you ran from that is still filled with killers. But there's a lot of good matches for him, like people to mention the Concepcion, the Arroyo twins, both of them, Estrada, Ron Visay if he chooses to. But well, let's say one of is not going to be apparently in Superfly 3. He's going to try to get another another easy fight in October in Thailand. But I also get it. There's also part of it where he was very young. And ultimately, you have bills to pay. <laughs> I, know, I, th I think his wife is a Japanese idol, if I'm correct. And idol singers... If I'm correct, don't tend to have a long shelf life in Japan because the music industry there is like an assembly line. So it could be a sense of the fact that I need to make money. I'm living comfortably, but I need to make money. I need to make sure that I'm really financially secure. But to make the most money I can, I can't stay in Japan. Because... Naya san has taken over. So I'm going to leave my mark in the U.S. And I'm going to make sure that the, my, my name here will be the one that's synonymous with good lower class Japanese boxing at this day and age in the U.S. before Inoue does. Because a lot of the newest fights based on this tournament are not going to be in the U.S. Mm, indeed. Let's move on to, uh, well, let me, a quick comment on um, Kazu Dayoka. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised that he decided to come back um, because he, 
when he retired uh, 2017, I think it was late 2016, early 2017, I can't remember. Uh, when he retired, he did so still having some fights on the table, still having um, um, unfinished business. Um, he was champion at 112, but uh, with the stuff popping off at Superfly 1-2, um, particularly at, at Junior Bantamweight, um, I felt there was opportunities for him to fight one. Uh, namely, he could move up and, and, and seek a fight with uh, Roman Gonzalez, who he admittedly ducked uh, when he was at 108, 105, 108, and 112. Uh, he was offered an opportunity to fight Roman, didn't take it. I'm think, I was thinking, given what has happened to Roman, his fights with SSR, that he could jump up and, and, and fight him. Um, and also uh, there was a, uh, some fights that he, some domestic fights that could have taken place with him in Japan. Um, so again, um, I'm glad that he's back. Um, he's making a, a big leap, uh, moving up to 115, um, loaded division. There are fights for him all around. And the more the merrier, I say, when it comes to the division, the more good fighters in the division, the better. Uh, 115 is loaded. I'm glad that he's there. The question is now, uh, where will he will he go? Um, I'm sure that this initial comeback fight will not be against someone tough. Uh, we will see the real opponents for Ioka um, in 2019. Will he just try to seek an opportunity with Ancajas? Will he finally fight Roman Gonzalez? Uh, a fight with SSR down the road? Uh, a fight with Juan Francisco Estrada. Uh, you never know. The possibilities right now for him are pretty endless. And again, um, I'm glad that he's back. Um, let's see what he does. Uh, move on and moving on into previewing some fights uh, for this weekend. Want to focus first on first in LA unification battle at 135. Mikey Garcia, Robert Easter Jr. Garcia has the WBC belt. Easter has the W IBF belt. Excuse me. I'll go to you, Jacob. I would give I would give Easter more of a chance if I tr trusted him more. What do I mean? He's a guy who has all the physical attributes in terms of height and reach, but from the fights I've seen, particularly since he's won the title, he doesn't use them, and as a result. Um, he has plateaued in terms of his progress. Many argue that he hasn't progressed, he has regressed. Um, with a couple of fights here and there that he, arguably he, he may not have deserved um, because I don't trust him using his height and reach. If he stands there in the pocket like he has during his uh, first two, three title defenses, he's in trouble against a Mikey Garcia. Mikey Garcia will land on him and hurt him. Um, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I unfortunately, you know, I, I do like Easter, but unfortunately, you know, after his his past performance, I, I haven't really, you know, I'm like you, I, I, I don't really see a change coming. And I actually think Garcia is going to knock him out. Um, I think he'll stop him maybe like mid to late uh, rounds. Um, so uh, Garcia, you know, he's just... He's very sound boxer. He, he's got some pop, and you know, I think he he has the ability to land on Easter. Uh, Easter has a lot of deficiencies. He doesn't use his attributes, like you said, to his advantage. So, um, I have a feeling that Easter will stop him. I mean, uh, Garcia will stop him. Um, but uh, thanks for having me on the show. I gotta drop off. I'm about to go into the train here, so um, I'm gonna lose contact. Okay. Uh, thanks for being on the show, Jacob. Hopefully, see you next week. Uh, Daniel, Bo, uh, your thoughts on uh, Garcia and Easter Jr. Yeah, that's that's I mean, the whole point of Robert Easter. Like in the fights versus Comey, sorry, not about Comey, the fights that he had with Shafikov, he never used the advantages that he has. So it's natural. He just decided to stay in the pocket and he's makes, he makes fights harder for himself than what he should be against that competition, but now you're facing the guy in Mikey who not only is already a, a much better boxer than you, but he's a lot more patient than you. 
He's a better tactician than you. And has knockout power in the weight class like you. So it's going to be a very, very interesting fight. And personally, I think I Mikey, to me, is going to take it because he's an overall better boxer. And ultimately, that patience is going to pay off. He's going to probably wear it on Easter, frustrate the young man, and ultimately catch him with something. Won't be as dramatic as what happens as each inning, but it'll be effective. Your thoughts, Bob? Uh, I actually thought, and I know, uh, uh, Shock, I was hoping to see an improvement. He just, uh, I thought, and I. Um, Bo, you're going in and out on us. Um, you may can have you to hear me? now. I can hear you now. I can hear you. See you now. Okay. Okay. I, 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 I was we just re- uh, 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 tuna, and I'd be lost uh, because exactly what gives. And there's an old in, in my spot. He cannot fight uh, with the advantages that he has. He's shown the of and his uh, Williams. And my, if uh, Cole, um, I look. All you see, you're, you're, not as cerebral as, you're still going yeah. out on us a little bit, though. You're still going out on me a little bit here. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to I'm going to go to Daniel and maybe see you can pop in and pop right back out, pop out and pop right back in quickly. And if you can, um, I'll go back to you. Uh, I'm going to you, Daniel. Talk about this uh, uh, last fight here um, taking place in in London. Uh, Dillian White, uh, this fight was a surprise when it was made, but um, the, as the fight has approached, I'm beginning to warm up to it more. Uh, Dillian White fighting uh, Joseph Parker. Joseph Parker, of course, uh, lost his title to uh, Anthony Joshua earlier this year in March uh, against Dillian White, who I believe is number one contender for Deontay Wilder's uh, WBC belt. Um, I can't get a good grip on this bout, Daniel. Um, I don't know whose style will play more into effect here. Um, will it be the boxing ability of Parker? Will it be the the, the body punching of Dillian White? Um, you, your, your thoughts on this? Who do you think has the advantage? That It's a very tough fight to judge in the aspect of what they're coming off of and their common denominator. With this, with this Anthony Joshua. If you want to go down through the common denominator, Dillian White is susceptible to be hit very well, while Parker has shown that he can take the distance and go along with the punches. The tricky part is going to be who can who can set their will first, because. Parker, we know for his division, you know, bro has short arms. That's why he's one of the better effective body punchers in the heavyweight division because he's kind of forced to be. At the same time, Dillian White is also has also been improving overall as a fighter since that loss to Joshua. And overall, like I said, there's a reason why he's he's earned that number one ranking from the WBC. The question to me in this fight is, is the winner of this fight guaranteed to be Joshua's next challenger? 
because you know he's fighting Pavetkin in September. And if Joshua's not going to fight Big Baby Miller, then that opens up the avenue for one of those two. And with Dillian White, it's a domestic fight. It's a fight that you can see happen in the UK, and it'll make a lot of money in the UK. With Parker, it's a like I said, it's an interesting fight because Parker took Joshua 12 rounds. And he gave Joshua some trouble that had he not had a ref that constantly broke him up whenever he was doing work, you might have seen how effective it would have been. So it's a very interesting fight. The question is, have promises been made to Eddie Hearn that the winner gets Joshua? I don't think so. I don't think the winner will get Joshua. Um, don't ask me why. I just don't. Um, I just don't. Uh, I think Joshua will go another route uh, for some reason. Let me go back to you, Bo. Um, see if you can. Uh, your sound is better. Can you hear me now? Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Keep going. Okay. No, I was like to the Robert Easter thing right quick. I I just think that uh, just fought Javier for was beating him. And if you look at all the people who asked the ring, see I just hard to believe that probably uh, Mikey Garcia, unless he be. I'm going to do the worker thing fight with um, Anthony. The Anthony Joshua already has a a second. Leave. I don't think either one in the BF. So, but he can make voluntarily defense. Dylan White, will we want to see a Dylan White fight too? Like, my thing is, whoever wins this, will, do we want to really see him fight those two guys again? I wasn't in, uh, Joseph Parker uh, did better than I thought against uh, Anthony Joshua, but still, um, I, I, Joseph Parker just doesn't convince me. Like, he's always been the weak link there to me. And Dylan White, well, he beat Dylan White once rather easily, in my honest opinion. And I've seen no improvement in Dylan White at all either. Dylan White, after fighting, um, Dylan White, after fight, he he fought guys like, uh, you know, over rough fought in two years. So, I mean, I'm, I like the, I don't think it gets anything. Be able to win, the sound. Then, uh, as bombs, uh, and movement, just oh uh, yeah. This, you know, this is body division. Um, could you repeat what you said in terms of the uh, uh um? Garcia uh Easter Jr. because he was going out again on us. Okay, no, I I just think that uh Robert Easton Jr. is as and he's gonna fight the same way as too smart of a fighter. Even if Robert but Mike and so skillful, I think he can knock Robert Easton Jr. Okay. Um I think we're gonna um sh uh, shut things down um on that note. Uh Jacob, he had to dip out. Again, he was uh, on getting ready to catch the train. Um, his work schedule has changed on us. If you want to um, talk boxing, if you want to talk movies with him, uh, you can check him out on Twitter at JTRAM. I uh, want to thank him for joining us on the show. I want to thank Gus for joining us on the show earlier. If you want to check out his work, uh, talking boxing, talking music, you can check him out, uh, Corruption and Boxing, um, on, G, on G Plus YouTube. 
I'll go back to you both for folks who want to talk to Sweet Science or anything else, follow the adventures of you and your daughter. Uh, let the people know they can hit you up. Kings, uh, box, and next, uh, sports talk, and uh, you come with to my just a kid's line that was really hilarious. Always, thank you. Okay, uh. Yeah, you was going. Your, your thing was real choppy, so I just kind of repeat uh, what you said. Uh, uh, for folks who want to check out your stuff, uh, be at Three Kings Boxing. You're a contributor to uh, Three Kings Boxing. Just go to threekingsboxing.com. Uh, if they want to follow you on Twitter, uh, check out your stuff at uh, Truth Truth and Fact Sports Talk. Uh, you can check him out on Twitter. That there at Truth T R U T H underscore F A C T B O X one. Truth and facts, truth underscore uh, facts, bo fact box one. You can also check him out on Twitter at uh, truth and facts sports on not Twitter, but on Instagram as well. And truth uh, underscore fact box one. Um, Daniel from the Inscriber, for those who want to talk uh, the sweet science, for those who want to talk the NBA specifically, especially when it comes to the Miami Heat, or for those who want to check you out, uh, push back against nonsense on. Twitter, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yeah, you can find me uh, on Twitter, Ruckus99, R-A-W-K-U-Z, 99. And like I said, I do my show with the folks at 4 I'm going to do it tomorrow night. Definitely going over this weekend, going over the fights. And definitely looking into what's going to become a very, very interesting Schedule this coming up because I think the WWE might have thrown a wrench in the PBC's plans. Hmm. What you mean? Quickly. Uh, I think the PBC was planning to do like some type of like lower marquee fight in the end of October. But apparently tonight WWE announced their first all women's pay-per-view happening at the Nassau Coliseum. Ah. Oh, okay. So yeah, I can see the dilemma there. Uh, for those who want to talk to sweet science or music or fitness with me, you can check me out on Twitter, uh, brother JR at brother JR76. Um, as I said when we began the show, if you want to check out all things regarding pound for pound box report, blog page is the place to go to p4p boxing report wordpress.com. That's the link. Check the right of the blog page. You can find the links to the channel and pages on Twitter, Facebook, G G Plus, YouTube. Tumblr, as well as how you can listen to the show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play Music, Player FM, uh, Stitcher, Mixcloud. Um, on the next episode, we will do a recap of Mikey Garcia. Uh, May top Luis Ortiz is fighting on the undercard of Garcia Easter Jr. We will also do a recap of Dillian White Joseph Parker. Um, very good card, by the way, that Dillian White Joseph Parker card. Uh, Talos Takam, he's fighting Derek Chisora. Katie Taylor defending her uh, two uh, women's lightweight belts, the rematch between Conor Ben and um, Cedric Pagnon, um, all on that same card. So we may delve into those bouts as well. And we will do a preview of um, Tevin Farmer, who was robbed of his first title opportunity. Uh, the Japanese fighter that he lost to was subsequently released, stripped of the belt because of draws a positive drug test. Well, Tevin Farmer is getting his second opportunity as he's going to fight Billy Dibb in Australia uh, for the vacant IBF belt. That bout you can find on ESPN Plus app. Uh, we will do a preview of that. And uh, we will also talk Sergey Kovalev, who's returning to the ring to fight Eliodor Gonzalez. Dimitri Bivol is fighting on the undercard against uh, Chalemba. So we will talk about um, all of those bouts um, and any other boxing news. That's to come up. So I want to thank again, um, thank Jacob from Jab Hook, thank Gus uh, from Corruption in Boxing, thank Daniel from the Inscriber. I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode 216, Pound for Pound Box Report. We will see you guys next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night. Good night, folks.